Hello, everyone. Welcome to Joint Innovating to TED Talk today. Today, we are happy to have Professor Francis Au, Head of Department of Civil Engineering, to be our moderator. Without further ado, Professor Au, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, Tech Talk is a series of forums and dialogues given by engineering researchers of diverse academic backgrounds to share their insights on innovation-related topics. Um, the topic this afternoon is to see a world in a grain of sand, a geotechnical researcher's perspective. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Professor Jun Yang. Professor Jun Yang joined the faculty after several years of research in Kyoto and Berlin, and is currently a full professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. His area of specialization is geotechnical and earthquake engineering. He has published extensively in leading journals in the fields and has been named by Claire Rivate among the world's top 1% scholars by citations. His work has been referenced in two design guides in the US. Among his honors are the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Invitation Fellowship, the NSFC Outstanding Overseas Young Scholar Award, the MOE Natural Science Award, the Zhengguo Si Lectureship, and a Distinguished Visiting Professorship of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. He was made a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers in 2012 and also holds fellowship of the Institution of Civil Engineers of the UK and the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers. Let's welcome Professor Jun Yang. Uh, thank you, uh, Francis. Uh, so, uh, because uh, I just finished two hours uh, lecturing, so the uh, organizer allowed me to to take off the, the, the mask. So I think it should be uh, quite okay because we have a sufficient uh, uh, distance. So don't worry about too much. Okay. And uh, so, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming and either uh, physically or uh, online. And I was told that uh, the tech talk uh, has the general public as a target audience. Uh, so uh, I come up with uh, this title and I try to uh, make my talk uh, as general as possible. Uh, but the, my talk today is not about the philosophy, uh, it's not about the poem, but I think it's a kind of uh, a reflection as you will see uh, later. So talking about the sand, uh, we all know uh, sand is a natural material and widely existing in uh, river beds, uh, sea beds, or on beaches. And in civil engineering, actually, uh, sand is perhaps a most commonly used uh, construction material. So we use sand to make concrete and then buildings and the structures. And we use sand to make loads, dams, embankments, and even islands. So uh, this picture actually is a bird eye view of the Palm Island on the coast of uh, Dubai, a famous site of many luxury uh, residences and uh, hotels. So about 120 million cubic meters of sand were used in the construction, okay? So now we have so beautiful uh, artificial uh, island. In Hong Kong, actually many lands have been reclaimed from the sea over the past decades or maybe one century. So this picture gives you the idea of 
the international airport, Hong Kong International Airport. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, this airport was opened in 1998, and the airport actually was uh, uh, built on a man-made island. So actually, uh, as a civil engineers or geotechnical engineers, we have uh, always we have concerns when we design, when we construct artificial islands. Uh, one of the uh, concerns, of course, is the long-term settlement of the island. And the other critical concern is the potential liquefaction uh, of the uh, sand fields. So here I'd like to give you an uh, example of uh, Kobe, Japan. And during 1995 Kobe earthquake, widespread liquefaction occurred at uh, artificial islands. So actually we have two uh, artificial islands here and along the coast of the Kobe city. So the liquefaction actually caused a large deformation of the ground and which led to the severe damage to the uh, various facilities, as you can see on the island. As Kobe is one of the largest uh, ports in Japan, so uh, the damage actually uh, led to a huge financial loss, as you can see, uh, is about uh, 150 billion. US dollars. Can you imagine? Actually, the shake was just about uh, less than 100 seconds. So, uh, so that means actually, really, we have to uh, worry about the, the potential uh, earthquake uh, damage to uh, artificial uh, islands. And the liquefaction actually uh, can be triggered not only by uh, seismic. I mean, the seismic loading or cyclic loading can also be triggered by uh, static loading. So in this case, uh, liquefaction is often uh, referred to as like a static liquefaction or flow liquefaction. So uh, this is an example, uh, the collapse of a large tailing stand in South Africa in 1994, uh, which killed 17 people and of course, and the other uh, widespread uh, damage uh, to uh, the environment. In Hong Kong, actually, uh, static liquefaction and the flow slice are also a critical concern in the construction of the like uh, field slopes, cut slopes, or large returning walls. So this picture gives you uh, the, this is actually, uh, some of you may uh, recall this, uh, deadly slow failures uh, on Hong Kong Island, actually not far away from the Hong Kong U campus uh, along the 50 years ago. So I think that this uh, uh, landslide claimed uh, 67 lives. And on the same day, there was a large uh, landslide in Sao Mao Ping, which also killed around 70 people. So uh, next, let's take a look at uh, a little bit uh, uh, technical details. So what is the soil liquefaction? So liquefaction uh, is a variety of phenomena in which a saturated soil transforms from a solid to a liquefied state. It usually occurs in sand or sandy soil for which the pore water pressure will influence how tightly the particles are pressed together. In particular, flow liquefaction or flow failure can produce the most catastrophic uh, effects of all liquefaction related phenomena. It is characterized by a sudden loss of strength and a rapid development of deformation. So uh, this uh, static or flow liquefaction actually can be triggered by either monotonic 
or cyclic loading. So that means what? Not only related to earthquakes, but also related to other factors. For example, a heavy rainfalls. So here, uh, uh, I show you two types of the sand behavior on the on-trend uh, loading. Okay. One is so-called cyclic mobility, and one is so-called flow type failure. Observed on uh, sand, uh, which is called Toyota sand. Actually, this is a kind of a stand testing sand uh, used in Japan. Uh, as well as in other places widely used in the soil mechanics lab. So here uh, we notice there is a good correspondence between cyclic behavior and the monotonic loading behavior. So when sand is in loose state, flow type failure can be triggered either by cyclic loading or monotonic loading. So uh, as you can see uh, here, right? the, the, the top two. And this flow type failure actually is characterized, uh, as I mentioned before, by abrupt uh, rapid uh, deformation. So of course, this is a big concern uh, in engineering uh, practice. On the other hand, the cyclic mobility is pertinent to sand in dense state. Uh, actually, as you can see here, uh, the cyclic mobility actually uh, is characterized by repeated loss and the regain of the stiffness along with the development of a large deformation. Essentially, uh, cyclic mobility uh, is related to a dilative strain hardening behavior of sand on the monotonic load. So the key message here is the density or the void ratio of sand is a critical factor for its behavior. Nevertheless, the behavior of sand can be much more complicated than this. So here I show you uh, the test results of two sand specimens. One is called the MT specimen. One is called the DD specimen. And the both specimens actually, they are consolidated to almost the same state, including the density or void ratio. And then they are subject to almost the same cyclic loading condition but they have a different, quite different uh, response. For the MT specimen, the response is a kind of flow type, as you can see here, uh, characterized uh, by uh, rapid abrupt deformation at the, the uh, loading cycle along the 95 cycles. For the DD specimen, on the other hand, the behavior is a kind of limit flow, which is characterized by a rapid development deformation, but with limited magnitude. And the following this, there is a stable accumulation uh, of the uh, plastic deformation. So, the limit flow is initiated around uh, 12 cycles. At this moment, we see the pore water pressure has a rapid rise. Correspondingly, the effect stress, we see a notable uh, reduction. And it's worth noting for the DD specimen, the pace of the pore water pressure generation is much faster than the empty specimen. For example, at the 10 loading cycles, we see the generated pore water pressure is around 250 kPa. But for the empty specimen at the 10 loading cycles, 
the generator export water pressure is just around the 100 kPa. Then we have the question, so what's the possible mechanism behind this? Given the two specimens, they have almost the same density and they are subject to the almost the same loading conditions, but they have a different liquefaction resistance and behavior. So in soil mechanics lab, actually for the MT specimen, it is prepared using the so-called moist tamping method. So in this method, actually the moist sand is placed in the mold. And then we apply the tamping to form layer by layer the specimen. On the other hand, the dry deposition method is used to prepare so-called DD specimen. So in this method, actually dry sand is deposited into the mold. And then we apply tamping okay, on the mold. So to form the specimen of a given or specific density for the testing. So if we look at the DD specimen, actually uh, this method, the dry deposition method, will produce the sand specimen somehow with strongly anisotropic structure. The particles tend to lie horizontally. That means the horizontally aligned uh, particles. The reason is understandable because of uh, gravity. Right, so the sand particles tend to deposit at the most uh, stable position. But for the empty specimen, the initial moisture will contribute to a certain level of suction. So this suction will hold these particles together. So the orientation of the particles will not be affected by gravity so much. So because of this reason, and we should expect uh, these two specimens, they have uh, somehow different microstructures. And the imaging analysis of the Toyota sand specimens prepared using these two methods confirms uh, this. Uh, DD specimen uh, indeed has somehow preferred particle orientations. Now, with this in mind, let's try to explain why the DD specimen has such kind of response. So because the DD specimen has somehow the preferred orientations of particles, during the cyclic loading, when the major principle stress, okay, is along the direction of the particle orientation, and the induced compressibility should be quite large. In other words, if the major principle stress direction is perpendicular to the deposition direction, and then the sand has more contractive response. And this more contractive response will lead to faster generation of pore water pressure. And then will lead to lower liquefaction resistance, okay? Because we have a cyclic loading, so we have a change of major principal stress direction in the loading uh, process. Next, uh, let's look at uh, another question. So what will happen when a small amount of fines is added into sand? Because Toyota sand as a standard testing sand is a clean sand. 
without any fines. But we know actually uh, natural sand often contains some amount of fines. And then we will, we have to ask this question. Okay. For example, if we have a Toyota sand mixed with silica fines, and then what will happen? So this slide gives you the test result of two specimens. One is Toyota sand with no fines. So this is the clean Toyota sand. One is Toyota sand with 10% of fines. Small amount, okay, not too much, 10%. And these two specimens are consolidated to almost the same state and then we apply almost the same cyclic loading condition. But it's very clear they have a different liquefaction resistance. For example, for the Toyota sand with no fines, it fails around, I think around at the loading cycle of uh, 77 or 78. But the for Toyota sand with just the 10% fines, it fails at around the seven to eight cycles. So in terms of liquefaction resistance, they have a significantly different liquefaction resistance. But we need to keep in mind, actually, uh, they have almost the same uh, water ratio or density and the confining stress. So this test result gives you very clear evidence so the fines tends to reduce the liquefaction resistance of sand. This is another excellent evidence for the law of fines in liquefaction resistance. So here we have another sand we call the Ottawa sand. And if we add just a 10% of fines into clean, Ottawa sand. On the, the given state, that means the wall ratio is around the 0 0.63 and the confining pressure around the 100 kPa. And the, the specimen here, okay, Ottawa sand with 10% of fines is a kind of a flow type feeling, okay? But on the other hand, Ottawa sand without fines, this behavior is the so-called cyclic mobility, okay? So actually cyclic mobility, as I mentioned to you before, so it's related to a kind of the dilating, strain hardening uh, response. Another interesting issue, when we look at the sand, and the fines mixtures is about the size disparity ratio. That means the ratio between the coarse sand particles and the fine particles. And on the otherwise similar conditions, this so-called size disparity ratio will also play an important role in the liquefaction resistance of sand. So the effect of fines now we see is very important for sand on the cyclic loading. And the similar effects of fines are also observed for the monotonic loading conditions. So here I show you the test results of three specimens. And these three specimens are consolidated to almost the same state. And then we applied the monotonic loading. So as you can see here, this is the clean toilet sand. And this is toilet sand with 5% fines. And this is toilet sand with 15% fines. Now we can see when we increase the fines content, the degree of shortening softening increases. 
for the Toyota Center with 15% fines. The specimen is fully liquefied with almost the zero residual strength. But for the clean Toyota sand, on the almost identical loading conditions, no liquefaction, has very high strength. And at the end of the test, they tend to arrive at the so-called critical state or steady state. Now, the next question we'd like to ask is, what about the law of particle shape or fines? So here I show you a test result on two specimens. One is Fujian sand mixed with 5% silica fines. One is Fujian sand mixed with 5% glass beads. And then we can see very different uh, response. And this difference actually is a kind of indication of the potential effects of particle shape of fines. So more details about this, uh, uh, we can, uh, you can find the details okay, in this paper. Here, I'd like to draw your attention is to the response of Fujian sand mixed with 5% glass bead. So we have very interesting observation. So the observation is in the initial stage of loading, there is a so-called stick slip response until a local minimum, which is called Cosine steady state in soil mechanics. And after that, there is no any static stick slip response, and the sand tends to achieve high strengths. So, in soil mechanics, there has been a concern about the cosine steady state because always. People are confused with this phenomenon. Why a material already filled, right, already filled at this local minimum, and then can regain its capacity. And this capacity can be much larger than the initial peak strength. So the question is whether this behavior is a real material behavior or is a kind of a testing error. So our study indicated actually the cosine steady state is a true material behavior, which is a transition state from metastable response to stable response. Because when material has metastable response, so we see the stick slip here, okay? Fortunately, when we test the Fujian sand mixed with 5% glass bead, we have this finding or we have this observation. Another interesting observation is when we test the Toyota sand mixed with 5% glass bead, but we don't see the stick slip response. Okay? No matter we change here the density or the water ratio. You can see the smooth the response, no any stick slip response. So here we have the question again. So what's the possible reason, right? We test the Fujian sand with 5% glass bead. We observe the stick slip response. But we test the Toyota sand mixed with 5% glass bead. No, this one. So we consider all these observed differences actually are associated with the particle shapes of these materials. So this slide gives you the, uh, the images of particles of Toyota sand, Fujian sand, and the silica fines, uh, and the glass beads 
along with their size distribution curves. So we try to use the laser diffraction method to measure the particle shape. And in terms of roundness, uh, we can see uh, the Fujian sand and the Toyota sand. They are comprised of subangular to subrounded particles. But the glass bead finds are highly spherical, rounded. As you can see, the roundness is close to one. The crushed silica finds are very angular. So this difference in particle shape actually contribute to the observed uh, difference of the uh, behavior. So what about the friction angle of this sand or the sand finds mixtures? Because as a civil engineer, we know the friction angle is perhaps the most important design parameter in almost all the projects. So I try to plot the friction angle at the critical state as a function of fine's content. So we have a very uh, interesting observation. For sand mixed with crushed silica fines, the critical state friction angle tends to increase with increasing fines content. But for sand mixed with rounded fines, here is glass beads. And we see the friction angle decreases with increasing fines content. And the variation of friction angle is more significant for sand mixed with rounded fines. So here the glass beads. Next, let's take a look at uh, uh, the question. What about uh, a granular material with identical grading but uh, different shape. Because so far, we look at the effect of fines and the effect of the particle shape of fines. That means we have a fines involved. So if we don't have fines involved, we just look at the sand. So what about the uh, effect of shape? So we prepare a sequence of binary mixtures, okay? by mixing Fujian sand of a particular gradient. So here we call the gradient A, with a supplied and crushed glass beads of the same gradient, but at the different percentages. So of course, as you can see here, the as supplied glass beads are highly spherical, rounded, but the crushed glass beads are very angular. And we use the laser scaling method, okay, with this uh, new technique, so we can quantify the particle shape in a more comprehensive manner, okay? So the different uh, shape parameter, for example, aspect ratio and uh, sphericity and, uh, of course, roundness. And then we extend the concept of combined roundness we proposed before and to the concept of the combined shape parameters for binary mixtures. So we can get the, a combined aspect ratio, combined sphericity, and this kind of uh, shape parameters. And also we propose an overall regularity, okay, OR, to collectively quantify the particle shape. So we can see, and all this, they have the different uh, uh, OR value, now, what about the result? So here I just uh, uh, present to you the selected result. One is for uh, FS60, G40, and the other is for FS60, C40. And these two specimens are on the almost the same uh, testing conditions. FS60, G40 stands for 60% Fujian sand mixed with 40% glass beads. FS60 C40 means 60% Fujian sand mixed with 40% crushed glass beads. So they have a different particle shapes in terms of, for example, overall regularity. They have a different 
response for the rounded specimen. Actually, the specimen is fully liquefied, but for the angular specimen, is highly dilated with the strong uh, strength. Now, quickly, the next question. So what about identical grain shape, but different gradients? Because we know in geotechnical applications, the grading is a very important physical property. When we deal with field materials, right? When we deal with sand, when we deal with the uh, sandy soils, when we deal with the CDG, we like to look at what about the uh, grading. So here, okay, we prepared uh, four uh, Fujian sand uh, with different gradations, okay? With different gradations. Gradation A, B, C, and D. But they have almost the similar uh, particle shapes. And then we like to look at the, how uh, gradation influenced the behavior of sand, including the liquefaction uh, resistance. Now, this is just the, uh, the one of the results. So one specimen is Fujian sand A, so gradation A. One is Fujian sand C, so gradation C. So they have a different gradation, but they have a similar particle shape, okay? And they are tested on almost the same condition, but we see very different behavior. So for Fujian sand C is almost fully liquefied, but for Fujian sand A, no any liquefaction. So this is very clear evidence for the effect of gradation on the behavior of sand on the liquefaction resistance of sand. So next, uh, I would like to briefly uh, introduce to you the small strain behavior of sand and the sandy soils. So far, we talk about the large strain shear behavior because we talk about the liquefaction, but what about the small strain behavior? So small strain behavior in mechanics, so that means this is associated with elastic wave propagation. So because we deal with the sand or sandy soil, a kind of granular material. So actually this is a very fundamental and difficult problem, the wave propagation uh, in uh, granular material. So we know unlike ordinary solids, so granular material, uh, we look at uh, uh, elastic wave velocity or stiffness, is dependent on packing density and it's dependent on confining stress. And this dependence is nonlinear. Okay, it's nonlinear. So that means what? It's very complicated compared with ordinary solids. So we set up at Hong Kong U advanced testing device uh, to measure the elastic wave propagation uh, in uh, soil specimens, including dynamic uh, properties. And this device actually has uh, uh, the function of uh, resin column, has a function of a torsional shear, and as a function of band elements. So the band elements actually is a kind of piezoelectric uh, transducer. So this transducer can be used to generate signals with different uh, frequencies. And then we look at the received signals, and then we try to identify the travel time of elastic wave. And from this, we can get the velocity of elastic wave. So we investigate a number of issues. For example, what about the effects of fines? What about the effects of the particle shape? And what about the confining stress? What about the packing density? So this is just an example of the shear wave signals of different uh, frequencies for sand specimen at a given state. And the right plot is Toyota sand with 10% fines. And the left plot is Toyota sand with 
no fines. And we notice the travel times of the shear waves are different. So the implication is what? The implication is the fines, the presence of fines can affect the shear wave velocity. So uh, this effect can be observed more clearly here. So uh, this is, uh, we have uh, uh, four specimens with different percentage uh, of fines. So we can see uh, the travel time of the shear wave will increase with increasing fines content. In other words, the shear wave velocity will be reduced when we add fines into the sand. And this slide gives you some result about the effect of particle shape on the shear wave velocity, as well as the shear modulus. So the left-hand side is the result for Ottawa sand on the different confining stress. The right plot is for Fujian sand on the different confining stress. So as you can see here, uh, these two sand have a different uh, uh, particle shape, for example, in terms of roundness. Ottawa sand is much more rounded. And the Fujian sand is subangular. So we can see on the otherwise similar condition, for example, for a given water ratio and the confining stress, Ottawa sand tends to have a lower shear wave velocity or the sh lower shear stiffness. Okay, shear stiffness. So this is the evidence for the effect of particle shape on the shear wave velocity. So far, all these effects of particle shape, particle size, or gradation, we observe these effects actually from a laboratory investigation. We have also made attempt to investigate the effects of this particle shape, particle size, and the gradation on the behavior using the grand scale model, okay, grand scale model. For example, in terms of the particle shape, we use the superquadric function to describe the particle shape. We can change the function parameters and then we can generate the particle shape, particles with different shapes, as you can see here. So this slide, as you can see, uh, left-hand side is computer generated particles. So we use the uh, coach, uh, function. And the right-hand side is the real sand particles, the CT scanning of the sand particles. So you can see indeed, okay, we can uh, model uh, the sand particles with different uh, shapes. Of course, in this uh, computer modeling, the challenge problem is how to detect the particle contents efficiently and accurately. So if you have irregular particle shapes. So we have successfully uh, modeled uh, the sand specimen with half a million uh, particles on the dynamic uh, excitation. And more details uh, about our uh, computer modeling okay, uh, can be found uh, in this paper, uh, which was published uh, two years ago in uh, GMPS. So uh, this cartoon gives you an idea how a small amount of fines can affect the shear wave velocity. And this numerical result confirm our 
findings in the laboratory. So our laboratory finding is when we add some fines into sand and the shear wave velocity will be reduced, will be reduced. Not only the shear wave velocity, but also the frequency contents uh, will be affected uh, by the fines. So as you can see here, uh, the, the left-hand side is for the uh, zero fines content, right-hand side is just for 5% fines content, but we have a different uh, frequency uh, contents. So in closing, I think the, uh, the take-home message uh, actually uh, is very uh, simple. Uh, the first one is sand or sandy soil is a granular material consisting of small or maybe tiny particles or grains. It can exist over a spectrum of status, which corresponds to a variety of response from fluid-like flow liquefaction, flow type failure, to solid-like strain hardening. Second, the characteristics of small grains, small particles, for example, shape, size, gradation, and even mineral composition can affect the packing patterns and the interaction of these individual particles and thereafter the overall behavior. So it's essential to look into the laws of small particles in understanding the complex behavior of sandy soils. And also to keep in mind the particle continuum duality, because this can lead to better engineering solutions. So in this context, I would like to say the findings I share with you today are kind of reflection of the philosophy hidden in the famous poem by William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wide flower, hold infinite in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Thank you.